Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we take a look at some unusual ways to teach kids the glories of entrepreneurship and palaver with a leading feminist commentator. In the second half of our show, we'll be joined by Sarah Squire, Senior Fellow at the Liberty Fund and Literary Editor of Feed.org. Up first, we're pleased to welcome back middle school teacher Jeff Sandifer, co-founder of the Acton Academy. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Bill. It's great to be back. Jeff, you're off to another great adventure. Before we get into it, take us back a little bit and refresh us on the Acton Academy and what you've done in primary education. Sure. Well, the Acton Academy, where my two boys go, is a one-room schoolhouse with 21st century technology devoted to the idea that uh, children are capable of far more than we've ever imagined. And they are. Uh, We're seeing them live where we believe that they are heroes on a hero's journey, that they're going to find a calling that will change the world. And in every single case, no matter how high we set the bar, they've amazed us. And it's a purely Socratic methodology? It is Socratic in that any adult on campus is not allowed at any time to make a declarative statement. You can only ask a question. So you can't teach, you can't lecture, you can only ask a question. There must be exceptions, like where's the bathroom? That's posted somewhere. If it's not posted, then that's on me, and I have to say, gee, that's a great question. You're going to have to figure it out. (laughs) And what age groups are these kids? There's three studios, elementary, middle school, and high school, Mm -hmm. 40 students in each, multi-age classroom. So it really is a one-room schoolhouse, and the students teach each other. They learn from each other. Um, It's not utopia. Some days it's Lord of the Flies. (laughs) Other days it's tyranny. But Bill, what it is, just like like a free market, it's it's anti-fragile. Every time it breaks... It comes back stronger. So, Jeff, we talked about the Acton Academy in depth last time I had you on. I just learned about the Acton Children's Business Fair. What is it and when did it start? Well, it started six years ago, and uh, our two boys, Charlie and Sam, came to us and said, we'd like to do a lemonade stand, but something different. We really want to come up with a business and have something to sell. And that sounded, that sounded like a good sure, idea. Give so, it a shot. Yeah, so we put out uh, a handful of card tables, and they went around and uh, rounded up their neighborhood friends, and we um, begged some neighbors to come over and buy from them. And, and it turned out, Bill, some of the businesses were surprisingly good. I mean, some were selling cupcakes, but others were, I remember a marshmallow gun made out of tubes that sold well. And so it was a so great- So a bunch of kids did bunch this. A bunch of kids. Yeah, so there were about 10 the first year, okay. just small and fun neighborhood thing. And we forgot about it. And then about eight months later, we started getting phone calls. Well, when are you going to have the Children's Business Fair again? <laughs> oh, and by the way, the name, um, we, we agonized as adults over all these fancy names, and we came up with ideas and how we what were going to call it. And what my six-year-old at the time said, well, why don't you just call it what it is, the Children's <laughs> Business Fair? And so that stuck. Um, so we, we started getting these phone calls. When are you going to have it again? We have to, our other children want to join, and so... We put out more card tables mm-hmm. and... Still in the neighborhood. Still in the neighborhood. 20 children came. And what were the range of businesses of those 20 kids? Oh, gosh. Uh, again, everything from selling food, but to artwork, magic games, pitch and toss. I mean, if you can imagine everything from a carnival game to some businesses that actually did really well, and I'll, I'll, some of the great businesses I'll tell you at the end, but some of them just, as you imagine, crafty-like things, yeah, and other yeah. ones very clever. I mean, some very clever And the businesses. kids came up with this on their own. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the amazing thing is there was no adult intervention, no curriculum, mm-hmm. no teachers. They set their own prices. They, they set their own made prices. Their own product decisions. They made their own products. And, and in fact, I think the biggest thing about the fair is if children can make something with their own hands, sell it for more than it costs to make, and keep the money... That's about all the lessons of entrepreneurship there is. It turns them on, doesn't it? It turns them on, and the rest of it they'll figure out. <laughs> and word of mouth, people just came and... Uh, people came, and so we thought that was fun. Right. Well, the third year, 40 booths were filled. No. And so now it starts to get bigger. You can't do that on the roadside in your neighborhood, can you? Well, we have a big yard, so we, have, we actually have a lot of space. <laughs> and uh, the next year, uh, 80 booths. And this last year, we had 125 booths, which is finally capacity, We had 250 children from 48 schools and over 1,300 visitors. 48 schools? 48 schools. All word of mouth, all with no marketing, purely the magic of uh, spreading by word of mouth. Well, you showed us a short video, which, of course, we can't do on the radio, but give us a picture of what this last fair was like and the kinds of kids that were there and their products. Oh, I mean, um, we we had one young lady um, who was selling her her greeting cards. Mm Mm-hmm. 
And uh, she, uh, as you heard in the video, she said, I hope to make $3,700. And these are hand-painted, hand like painted uh, her and own and artwork. And then, yeah, they were hand-painted and then, uh, and then reproduced. Uh, produced, reproduced. Yeah. And it turns out that she didn't make $3,700. It turns out she actually signed two retail contracts at the <laughs> fair, and she made $26,000, and that's net, not gross. That's so net? Here's a 12-year-old making $26,000 on a, just an idea she came up with. And she signed the contract? And she, she signed the contract. You know, she got it all done, and, and, so it's, you know, and, and there were just two retailers that happened to love her wear, and she's incredibly talented. But that's an example of, I mean, these aren't all cupcake stands. Yeah, sure. What else did you have there? Oh gosh, we had uh, uh, we had a kid doing magic tricks. We had someone selling candy sushi. We had uh, this is very politically incorrect. But we had a paintball uh, stamp. Some you could shoot one child's brother with a paintball gun uh, for a certain <laughs> price. Um, I, as I understand it, that deal got renegotiated about halfway through. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the profit splits. I mean, there were 125 different booths. So uh, almost anything under the sun. And through the eyes of the kids, they couldn't have all been successful, right? Some of them no. must have bombed. What, what did they take away from it? Well, I, I think you learn a lot of things. One is that you have to be very careful with inventory. So they learn that businesses without inventory are actually less risky than businesses with inventory. Mm. So I remember one child made uh, lots of, of wooden bows and spears, mm -hmm. and so he spent a lot of effort, and they didn't all sell. And so he was left with the excess inventory. You learn lessons like uh, you've got to be very careful if last year's hot product is likely to have four booths selling that next year. So competition, you learn this whole pattern of, but if you wait three years, by then people have forgotten, forgotten the hot idea and you, come and you back can repeat it. it. So the cyclicality that they've learned about the business. Absolutely. Every lesson about markets and supply and demand and competition, you can see being played out in a very sophisticated way when you get that many booths and that many people. How did the community react to this? The community loves it. I mean, and I mean, we've had, as I said, no advertising. We had thirteen hundred people show up. So um, people come from far and wide, and the, the, also the children they'll get very sophisticated about bringing lots of friends. The more friends you bring in, uh. the more you sell. So there's lots of marketing going on before the fair to attract people because we don't do anything. The children do it all. Now you said forty eight schools, so this is well beyond the acting academy. Now you went to the public school system and private schools and, oh, you and name homeschoolers. It? Uh, I mean, it's a very diverse group. And they've insisted you expand this. Well, they have, and we've now reached capacity in Austin. Uh, so we've started to offer it to other people around the country. But, but yeah, we've, we've reached the capacity at ours in Austin. But now, actually, there's two more in Austin that have started. So they're easy to put on. So these are like copycat events? Absolutely. Or, which Absolutely. you must be thrilled about. Oh, we're thrilled. Oh, no. <laughs> in fact, we even provide prize money for the copycat. So we love the idea of people copying it. As you watch the kids react to success and failure, do you see it affect their personality at all? Do they get a swelled head sometimes? Do they get ahead of themselves? What have you observed? You know, I don't, I, we don't see that. You do see the disappointment. I mean, if, if, if you don't sell well and you don't sell out, I think of two years ago, uh, we had one child that was selling hot chocolate, and it turned out to be a very warm day. Oh. So there was a lot of effort <laughs> put into producing lots of hot chocolate, and so that's certainly disappointing. You don't see the swelled heads as much. I mean, you see being proud of doing something, mm -hmm. but there's not posturing or bouncing around. It's just, it, it, it's a celebratory, mm -hmm. it's a very celebratory happy place. And do they celebrate each other's successes? Absolutely. Well, and, and there's, the other thing that's funny is not only they celebrate, but you'll see people making side deals. If you'll, in fact, promote my booth <laughs> no, that's, you know, that's 50 yards away, there's all sorts of co-marketing. They have hawkers going out and hawking products and, bring, and providing free samples it's to a come Turkish to my bazaar. booth. It's absolutely like being in a Turkish bazaar. And they figure this out on their own all it's all self-organized now how did you get away with this hardly a week goes by i don't read another article about a lemonade stand being shut down by the health police you said there's cupcakes and cocoa and how did that ha come off well I, I have to say that i'm i'm very big on the you know you you, you beg for forgiveness not you don't ask for permission mm. and so we didn't and in fact but it snuck up on us it just kept growing and growing and and um it turns out the city has has been much more forgiving than I thought. There's a hmm. there's some sort of artisan's rule that you can have small businesses and that you can sell a certain limited number of product on a limited number of days. So so we've been lucky. Now the the fire ex inspectors have been in and we have mm -hmm. to get permits. Right. So it's and gotten to be much more. Of a, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 not without some regulation, but it's been much more reasonable than I might have feared. And you're getting ready to take this national with other with other groups. Well, we finally woke up and realized that there were other people that would like to do this. So we've put a uh, website together and a kit, and we've offered prize money, and we've got thirty 
business fairs around the world signed up now. No. We expect at least 40 uh, this year, <laughs> and we're preparing for over 100 the, the next year. And again, all word of mouth. And what's the URL for people who might want to do one of these? It's uh, launchcbf.org. Or you can just Google Children's Business Fair, and it'll come up. So, Jeff, you've got me all excited about this Acton Children's Business Fair. And as we were walking over here to put our headsets on, you mentioned that one of the participants got on Shark Tank? Yes. We had a young woman named Michaela who came for the first time at age four and a half. No. And she sold Sweet Bee Lemonade. And so it was lemonade made from her grandmother's recipe with with some sort of uh, secret bee ingredient. Bee honey or something? Bee honey of some kind. And uh, she did very well. In fact, it was one of the most popular stands that year. The only one that was more popular, by the way, was bacon on a stick. That turned out to be her <laughs> that right. year. You but, can't but, be bacon. But she, had it, but she had a lion you know, uh, around the booth, people uh-huh. waiting. And the next year, she had more customers. And then she was five the day. She year. was five. <laughs> and suddenly, she signs a deal with Whole Foods. No. And she goes in Whole Foods. And then this in, last- In Austin. In Austin. But then it goes regional- and she ends up hiring her parents, but it's very much her business. I mean, yeah. I know the family, I know her. She's running the whole thing. <laughs> she goes on Shark Tank at age nine and a half, and she's funded by Shark Tank. No. And, and she just raised another round of capital at a $3 million valuation. So, <laughs> she's, this, but this is a real business now. It's she's a got very real quality business. control and inspectors and oh, the whole absolutely. deal. And it's in Whole Foods around the Southwest and about to go national. And my favorite moment on Shark Tank, one of the sharks, you know, who can be a yeah, yeah, sarcastic yeah. group, said to her, if you really believed in this business, you would quit school and be full-time CEO. And, and she's nine and a half. She's nine and a half. Without missing a beat, she looked straight at him and very seriously said, I've been CEO of my business for over half my life. How many of your entrepreneurs can say that? <laughs> and the shark threw up his hands That's and it. said, he said, you got me. You win. You, you win. win. Wow. You mentioned another young lady who started a greeting card business around her artwork. Tell us about her. Well, she's one of my students at Acton Academy and very gifted artist. And I think the best story about her is that this this whole greeting card business that took off is really her second business. That's kind of a sideline. <laughs> well, how old is she? Uh, she's 12. She was 12 at the time. She's 13 now. But her real business is fashion design. And so at Acton Academy, everyone gets apprenticeships. You find your calling, you identify some great skill, mm-hmm. a deep burning need in the world, and you go out and find a real apprenticeship where you actually get your hands dirty and work. So she'd done that for several years in fashion design. And it turns out she's incredibly gifted. Now, is this kids' fashion? I mean, this is... Oh, uh, no, it's, it's uh, high fashion. No kidding. Which is something I know nothing about, but it was high fashion. And so she ends up being called to New York for a special apprenticeship. This is after being in L.A. for an apprenticeship and then up to New York. No, no. She's 12 12 and 13. You're going to school in Austin and she gets an apprenticeship in New York? Yes. How does that that work? Well, she's that good because it doesn't matter how old you are. It matters whether your designs will sell. So she goes in and has a two-hour interview and she comes out uh, from the interview, and she Googles Donna Karen to see who it is that she's <laughs> been meeting with. <laughs> Donna Karen was just blown away by her talent and wanted to call her in and, and give her advice. So this is a young lady that, I mean, she's going places. And you know, as an educator, this has got to bring tears to your eyes because this is the hero's journey you talk about, isn't it? Absolutely. No, it is the hero's journey. And it's, you know, I guess what it's humbling is there's really nothing that we do other than believe in them. I mean, we offer structure and we offer, but, but it's, it's believing that the children are capable of far more than you've ever imagined, and they never disappoint now us. Now, I got to ask, are these specially selected kids, the cream of the crop, or, or what about regular people? Uh, they are not special. They are self-selected. So they're all special. Uh, how they're self-selecting, you know, I hear all the time, well, could kids in inner city neighborhoods do this? And I don't teach in the inner city, but my belief is absolutely. You give them a choice. You give them a chance. You hold them directly accountable. It's not easy, right? They may fail. I'm there sure. may be tears. And it's going to be hard. Yeah, and, and that stays true even if you're 50. Right? Well, you know, our big thing is heroes don't always win. Heroes aren't celebrities. Now, that's not what a hero is. What heroes always do is they always get back up. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with getting knocked down, but there is something where you have to get back up, dust yourself off, and try again. But this turns the pedagogy of our entire Prussian designed education system on its head. Is anybody listening? Oh, I, they are listening. Uh, in fact, I just opened my email as you and I were walking back over. 
This week, we had 48 applications to open an Acton Academy. So we'll have 40 Acton Academies launched by September of this year. And we're getting somewhere between five and seven applications every day to launch a school. So I think parents are fed up. I think parents want something more for their children. I think they believe they deserve a hero's journey and a calling and a chance to change the world. And we're seeing that spread, again, totally word of mouth, we're seeing it spread all across the world. What does it cost to launch an Acton Academy? Uh, it depends on how you launch it, but if you start it in a church or a home like most of our parents mm-hmm. do, you can launch one for less than $20,000. So the homeschooling movement must be grabbing onto this big yeah. time. I mean, really, you think about it. If you and I have a choice to homeschool or to start a school with mm-hmm. a kit that you can, that'll grow on its own, it's really almost easier to have a community around. So this is a chance for whether you're a homeschooler or an entrepreneur that wants something more to launch a school. And just like the Children's Business Fair, they start, start small mm-hmm. and they grow and the community gets stronger. And then you see these young heroes emerge. In different states, aren't there a lot of regulatory hoops you got to jump through to start a school? Well, there aren't. It depends on the state. And, and we're really, you know, we're really arming parent entrepreneurs. We're arming them to go out so we don't give advice on regulations. They have to go fight that battle. My hope is, though, this starts a thousand little entrepreneurial schools that suddenly the regulators find they have to give in. This is the Uber approach. This is the Uber approach. It's the Uber approach. And it's the Uber approach in many ways because it's you know children teaching each other and mm. learning from each other. And it's the mix of, of ages that makes such a big difference in Absolutely. making this work. No. The, the kids really do learn from their elder brothers and sisters. Absolutely. So, Jeff, I follow the college scene quite closely, and it's been very distressing as we're infantilizing our college students. We're, we're making their worlds narrower and narrower, more and more rules. They're graduating with fewer and fewer marketable skills, and you're turning 12-year-olds into CEOs. What's going on? Well, the only business I'm going to be sure not to get into is the higher education market <laughs> because it, it's, uh, I mean, you're seeing the collapse all around us. In fact, at a major university, I heard this week from someone inside, the number of students taking history has decreased 50% in the last four years. Wow. Now, they're still taking history, but they're doing it online. Oh. And so this school has added more history professors, of course, sure. while the number of students has dropped in half. But Bill, what that says, if you're running a college, think about if you lose your freshman and sophomore classes. Right, the feeder classes. Your feeder classes, but that's 150% of your margins because you lose money on your junior and senior classes. The freshman, sophomore, you can put them in a TA, you have 400 students, you don't pay the TA anything. But what's happening is we're seeing people flee to the online courses in the free. If I can get my freshman and sophomore classes for free, the entire higher, higher education model folds. What about the credential part of the system? Isn't that what drives it? For $50 each, I can get a certificate from uh, edX that has Harvard or Stanford or MIT stamped on it and proves that I made an A. So, Jeff, how are you preparing your students for the new world of higher education and then the new gig economy that comes afterwards? Sure. Well, what we want to do is give them lots of options. If you get a free ride to MIT or Caltech, of course you take it, right? Mm-hmm. But we're in the options to... Go to MIT for four years to do two years of online for free and then go to a state university and finish. Or perhaps you take an apprenticeship and you become the next Steve Jobs, the next Bill Gates. So the whole idea is in this world that's so uncertain, you want children armed with a calling. You want them to come out with a sense of how to work hard at a real business. And then you want them to have lots of options for which credentials they need or don't need to set them free. Talk a little bit more about this finding of a calling. One of the things I find most distressing with some college kids is they come out, they got a diploma, they've been through all these years of school, and they still don't know what they want to do when they grow up. There's a mistake that a lot of 16 and 17-year-olds make that I'm going to go to college and college is going to tell me what to do with my life. And of course, universities don't do that. That's Mm -hmm. That's not their role. So our approach is if you can find something you're very good at, that you're in flow, you find yourself losing a sense of time, you love it so much, it solves a deep burning need in the world. If that's not a calling, it's at least going to be a great two-year adventure. And if a two-year adventure becomes a 10-year mastery, and then I suddenly have several other two-year things that light you up, yeah, Yeah. that light me up, then I'm going to look back at that and those threads are going to come together. And that's what the calling is going to be. I may not see my calling looking forward, but I can see it woven looking back. But what I want to be doing is something I love to do, that I have a passion. And by the way, Bill, the word passion, it doesn't mean fun. It means willingness to suffer for Oh, tell me about it. I love it so much. I'll suffer the work. I'll do the work. I'll have the failures. I'll get back up. And if we can arm them with that kind of passion, it's something they're good at, then college becomes 
not the end and not an empty end where I find myself back on my parents' couch. It becomes a means to an end. So what happens to this gigantic ecosystem of K-12 through public education, colleges that are being supported by a trillion dollars in student loans? Ten years from now, this all starts to look like obsolete. What happens? You know, my charge is to, to help arm parents to start as many of these as possible, and I'm going to let the university presidents figure that one out. <laughs> okay. Rather than reform, I love disruption. I'm going to stay on the positive disruption side, and uh, higher ed can sort itself out. Jeff, let's wrap up by talking about your hero's quest. You made your bones in the energy business and a lot of money along the way. You've decided to become an education entrepreneur. You've launched this Acton Academy, which has taken off like a rocket. You've got these business fairs now that are teaching 12-year-olds to be CEOs. Where's your journey heading? Bill, I have no idea where my journey's heading. And you know, if you look in retrospect, it all sounds like a well-planned, well-oiled <laughs> machine, and it wasn't that. Uh, in fact, Acton Academy was started by my wife for our two boys, and I really worked for her. It's been a series of experiments, and we do more of those that work. And if it doesn't work, we stop doing it, and you have hope in the future. And so it's, it's not some, you know, a calling's not a plan. A calling is a series of adventures and experiments, and you do them, and you try hard, and you get back up. And so it, it's not a plan. And I don't know if we'll start 40 more acting academies or 1,000 more. That's really in God's hands. That's not in my hands. We just get up every day and try as hard as we can. You know, I work a lot with MIT students, and nothing distresses me more than to see them go off to Goldman Sachs or Booz Allen. How do we get them to head where, where you went? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think the most important thing any teacher does if you think back on your great teachers, the ones that love you, it wasn't that they were terrific at teaching math or social studies. It was that they believed in you. They, they, you trusted them and they said, Bill, you're special. And so I think the most important thing is you have to believe that children are capable of far more than we've ever imagined. And if you believe that, that's the spark. That's the difference. Starting at age five. Starting at age five. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure. That was middle school teacher Jeff Sandifer, co-founder of the Acton Academy, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresa. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows, stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. Today's program was partially underwritten by the generous support of Donors Trust, a donor-advised fund committed to promoting a free society. For more information, visit DonorsTrust.org. Ahead, Sarah Squire from the Liberty Fund joins us to take a kinder, gentler look at issues in contemporary feminism. Stay tuned.